It's a June afternoon in London, 1824. Horseshoes and carriage wheels clatter over St. Martin's Lane, where some stop in front of the four-story facade of Old Slaughter's Coffee House to deposit passengers for the founding meeting of the Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. The 22 founders are of social and political standing, consisting of members of Parliament, the clergy, and landowning proprietors. Though they wouldn't have drawn much attention from the regulars at Old Slaughter's, better known as the coffee shop on the pavement, none of the attendees would have escaped the attention of the meeting's organizer, the Reverend Arthur Broom. Though the London Times had run an announcement about the meeting, inviting the public, Broom had carefully selected and confirmed the guests he was expecting. They included Fowl Buxton, the Parliament member and well-known social reformer, as well as Richard Martin, an Irish representative to Parliament, who had succeeded in passing the Humane Treatment of Cattle Act two years earlier in 1822. Broom had tried and failed to start the society in 1822 with a similar meeting at Old Slaughter's, but the effort had stalled. After the failed first start, the Oxford graduate spent the next two years gathering funds to try again by republishing some of his earlier papers, sermons, and texts while continuing to support his wife and daughter through his well-paid stipend position at St. Mary's Church, Bromley, St. Leonard. In early 1824, however, after 20 years of serving with the Church of England, Broom quit the job to focus on getting the world's first SPCA established. He had also started paying an inspector out of pocket to patrol Smithfield Market, searching for violators of the 1822 law. All his effort and planning this time would succeed, though not in any way he probably imagined. The society he's about to form will actually create and then oversee animal law for centuries. They'd have cockfighting banned across England within the first decade and would be instrumental in bands of cockfighting in other countries. Today, almost 200 years later, there are satellite organizations in countries all over the globe and in many major cities. 16 years after Broom's meeting, the Crown will grant it a royal commission, and its members will dominate the politics and business of animal law in the country for centuries. And maybe Broom imagined all that the first day, but he couldn't have known they'd do it all without him. Broom will become the man who bet all he has on this second attempt to form the SPCA, succeed, and still somehow lose his ass. How did this special interest group, plagued by infighting and bankruptcy through its early years, outlaw the sport of kings in England within a decade, much less survive and continue to thrive well enough to proliferate a new class of laws for animals in the Western world? The last few episodes, we've explored the British love of cockfighting, Today, we dive into the world of British politics at the outset of the Industrial Revolution to learn about the origins of animal rights law and the outlaw to not the end of cockfighting in the country. Y'all get them ready. In addition to learning Broom's fate, today we'll get to know several of the men at the helm of the SPCA through its inauspicious start. We'll take a look at the founding principles and structure of the SPCA, and I've got some stories about their early causes and campaigns that I hope you'll like. But first, let's get back to Broome and the first meeting at the coffee shop on the pavement in London. Everything comes together as planned. Val Buxton serves as the honorary chairman, and Broome leads the proceedings as secretary. Despite the fact that he's paid an inspector to help Richard Martin police and prosecute violations of the Cattle Act in recent months. Broom says the inspector position, pay, and in fact the whole business of prosecuting violations should be up for discussion. He suggested education, reaching the public through sermons, tracts, and other means of persuasion rather than prosecution. Prosecuting societies, he told them, quote, look like powerful and, of course, most objectionable and unconstitutional confederacies acting in opposition to an individual and subject to gross abuse and mismanagement. End quote. It's not clear what his motives were here, since he's paid a guy to do this for months, with some success and favorable press coverage. It's possible that he just wants to stop personally paying the inspector, have the society take over the cost, or maybe he soured of it after spending some time doing it. Whatever his reasons, several in the group thought the prosecutions were necessary for reform. One of them said, quote, The class of men with whom the efforts of this meeting would probably come in contact are now sunk in the lowest state of ignorance and brutality, and altogether unassailable by such weapons as tracts or sermons because they never read nor went to church. 
They decided upon an approach that included both, splitting to form two committees, one to educate the public and the other to pursue legal action against animal law violators. The society's first 10 years would be a roller coaster ride. They'd also outlaw cockfighting in that time, and they'd do it without hardly mentioning it by name. Early in the 1800s, London cockpits included Moss Alley, Bankside Southward, The New Pit, Hoxton, Little Grosvenor Street, and Millbank, which in 1831 was called the New Royal Cockpit. It's the Georgian heyday of cocking still in 1800. The role of the gamecock as a model for British soldiers was still a proud standard for many in the military and probably extended to more than a few civilians. The British saw the fighting cock as a model for civilian and military men a symbol of pride, confidence, and fearlessness. It was also said to act as a deterrent to Britain's enemies, who knew that soldiers who hold the fighting cock in such high esteem would die before they surrender and possessed an irrational, unflinching mindset toward their defense of crown and country. The fighting cock remained a popular standard bearer for the British military well into the 1800s and was iconic enough to influence the outcome of a naval battle in 1794. That summer, Commander George Berkeley was at the helm of the HMS Marlborough, a third-rate 74-gun sailing ship that was one of a few dozen vessels in Lord Howe's fleet during the Battle of the Glorious First of June, the largest fleet action between the Royal Navy and the First French Republic during the French Revolutionary Wars. The battle took place about 400 miles west of the French coastline as Howe sought to prevent the passage of a grain ship from America. He failed to stop the shipment, but established a blockade as a result of the battle, which prevented future shipments. The British fleet outnumbered the French 37 vessels to 33, though the French had more firepower and heavier shot in their line. Admiral Howe tried a new technique in this battle. Once the two sides were all lined up, he ordered his fleet to turn and sail straight for a corresponding spot in the French line. The idea was for the British vessels to cross the French line, and as they did so, send their cannon shot down the length of the nearest French vessel. Aside from being entirely unconventional, it was a ballsy maneuver for each of the British ships to execute. Howe was essentially telling them, run right down the barrel of the French lines. The French gunmen would have their shots at the charging British ships. But Howe was betting that the surprise maneuver would catch the inexperienced French gunners off guard, allowing the British ships to unload devastating attacks as they passed through the line. Thanks to confusion or refusal by some ship's commanders, The maneuver was only executed by a few ships, including the Marlboro, which crossed and delivered decisive blows to the fellow 74-gun French Impeto. The problem was that the Marlboro wound up pinned on the other side of the French ship line, separated from its fleet and outnumbered. The Marlboro's crew fought off multiple French ships at very close range in the hours that followed. Hundreds of cannon blasts filled the air with smoke and flying metal. At one point, the Marlboro became entangled with the listless Impeto. In the confusion, smoke, and blasts, another French ship came to the Impeto's rescue, but sailed straight into the Marlboro, entangling the three ships together. The crews battled hand-to-hand until the ships had untangled and began battering one another again with cannon fire. Early in the fighting, Berkeley had suffered serious head and leg injuries and was taken below deck. In the hours of battle that followed, his lieutenant would have an arm shot off. The Marlboro held its own for a while, immobilizing the Impeto, which would later be captured, and damaging another French ship which had come to its aid. But after several hours of fighting, the outnumbered Marlboro was near destruction. All three of its masts had been blasted away, along with portions of its hull and deck. A chicken coop on board which had held flock of table poultry was destroyed in the fighting, and cackling chickens and feathers scattered into the haze and shrapnel around the decimated crew of the Marlboro. With their ship in shambles, immobilized behind enemy lines, outgunned, and on the brink of destruction, the options narrowed for the Marlboro's crew. Surrender the Marlboro to the French, or go down fighting. Lieutenant Monckton, now in command of the ship, attempted to rally the men. I'll be damned if she'll ever surrender, Monckton hollered, adding that he planned to nail the Marlboro's colors to the busted stump of the ship's main mast and keep fighting until the end. As Monckton spoke, a lone gamecock which had been indiscriminately lumped in with the ship's table poultry in the busted coop on the deck of the ship flew through the clouds of smoke to the top of the main mast's splintered stump. There, the rooster clapped his wings and belted a crow over the heads of the men. And in a moment, the Marlboro's remaining crew took up Moncton's defiant response to the certain destruction that awaited them. 
They let out cheers and fought with new vigor. The decision, it seemed, had been made. The Marlboro's crew would die before they surrendered. But the effort brought them some time. Soon, a pair of British ships had joined the fight. One of them was able to tow the Marlboro to safety, while the other captured the Impeto. After the battle, the Marlboro docked at Plymouth, England for repairs, and Admiral Berkeley handed the celebrated fighting cock off to Lord George Lennox, and a silver medal was struck with the story of the rooster's role in the battle to adorn the rooster's neck. According to Lennox's niece, people often came to see the famous rooster, which roamed the gardens under the care of the Lennox family until it died of old age. The story was reported in several newspaper reports and is noted in several histories of the British Navy. But the British would soon become a society which would be unlikely to herald a gamecock, even if it played such a pivotal role in combat against a rival nation. In fact, by the end of the 19th century, many British soldiers probably wouldn't have understood the sentiment seized upon instantaneously by the men on deck of the Marlboro that day, when they saw or heard the fearless gamecock take roost on the highest point it could find on the splintered ship and let out its challenge. But even as that battle unfolded, a wave of new sentiment had begun to gather among the public. In the second half of the 1700s, philosophical arguments on animal sentience and natural law had begun to trickle down from lofty thinkers to academics, professors, and the general public. Letters to newspaper editors, sermon messages, and other circulated publications began to argue for compassion towards animals. Some went a step further and condemned various acts. Horse racing, the use of carriage horses, hunting, and farming were included in some of these publications in addition to cockfighting. People were thinking differently about a lot of things, and animal rights legislation was just one of many new concepts up for discussion in 19th century England. That same century, the country would overhaul both the sewage and election systems in London. They'd create a police force, dabble with the idea of temperance, adopt child labor laws. In 1800, they remained a few years from any legislation to free slaves on the main island, and a few decades from freeing them throughout the empire. The century also includes the Industrial Revolution, which was born in England. I won't go much farther into the fray of British life during this period, but I want to point out one important issue occurring during the period that cockfighting was banned. The country's population was growing astronomically each year. In 1801, the population of England and Wales was 10.5 million, probably up from 6 million in 1740. By 1841, that number climbed to 16.9 million and was still growing fast. This created rapid urban growth as the rural population remained unchanged. It also created parity between the middle class consisting mostly of skilled tradesmen and the working class manual laborers who lived brutal, short lives, often without clean food or water, while the middle class lived in more or less modern comfort with regular wages, proper clothing, food to eat, and access to education. The problem of the poor, as I'll call it, often resulted in reforms that just swept various undesirable things under the rug rather than addressing the cause. Such was the case argued against the earliest reformers of animal law. In 1800, William Putney introduced a bill to ban bull baiting, an activity that involves chaining a bull, though often substituted for a bear or other animal, to a fixed point in an arena with enough room to maneuver while the participants sick their dogs on the beast from the fray. The dogs would attempt to get a jaw hold on the bull's flesh and could be difficult to remove when they did though they often failed and were thrown high into the air by the bull. It was considered a means of testing dogs by its supporters. The animal bait had once been popular enough to merit the construction of bear gardens in closed stadium arenas, of which there were several in London over the years, most notably south of the Thames River from London. King James I enjoyed the events, as well as the notorious patron of the theater arts throughout Shakespeare's time, Queen Elizabeth, who prohibited theaters from performing plays on Thursdays to prevent their interference with the Bear Garden proceedings. But by the time Putney introduced his 1800 bill to ban the practice, animal baiting seems to have been on its way out in the city. The original Bear Garden was long gone, and animal baits were on the decline as a matter of choice, it would seem. They still occurred, usually coinciding with a festival or holiday celebration, and were, as you may have guessed it, well attended by the working class. According to Putney, 1,400 people had attended the most recent event in his home county of Shropshire. Putney's bill, as well as another introduced two years later, failed on opposition from Secretary of War William Wyndham. Among other things, Wyndham challenged the high moral position taken by the reformers, accusing them of attacking lower-class activities 
while giving a pass to what he said were morally similar recreations enjoyed by the elite, such as fox hunting and hare coursing, where packs of dogs chase down and sometimes eviscerate their prey as owners watch on horseback. Putney's bill and the near-identical 1802 measure both failed and bear and bull baiting remained legal. The reformers wouldn't try another animal legislation until 1809, when the bill by Thomas Erskine proposed broadly to make cruelty towards certain animals a crime. This proposal attempted to recast the way the law treated animals. Animal-related laws had been on the books in England and elsewhere for over a century. Slaughter, for example, was required to be done outside of the walled cities, with the objective of reducing the menacing stench in town. Such laws were human-centric. What Erskine and his successors sought was an animal-centric legislation, where the law exists to protect, defend, or uphold an animal's rights. This would create a new protected legal class and imply animals were endowed with certain rights. It was a new concept, at least to the British and much of the Western world at that time. This is still the early 1800s, and everyone still gets around on horseback or horse-drawn buggies, or they walk. The strength of Erskine's appeal lies in the fact that everyone hearing it would have had some recent memory of an act towards an animal that they thought crossed the line. Animals are a daily part of life for everyone during this period. They're a much different part of the lives of city folk, but they're everywhere. Wyndham argued the crime was subjective. He said, quote, You inflict pains and penalties upon conditions which no man is able previously to ascertain. You require men to live by an unknown rule. You make the condition of life uncertain by exposing men to the operation of a law which they cannot know till it visits them in the shape of punishment, end quote. Other opponents said Erskine's law was simply not a topic fit for legislating. The bill was defeated in the House of Lords, and the reformers wouldn't try again until 1822, achieving one of, if not the first, national animal rights legislation ever passed. The Irish Parliament member from our opening scene, Richard Martin, pushed the 1822 Cruel Treatment of Cattle Act through Parliament, making it a crime to abuse any horse, mare, gelding, mule, ass, ox, cow, heifer, steer, sheep, or cattle punishable up to five pounds or two months hard labor. Martin drafted the bill with Erskine's help. Technically, it didn't outlaw anything in particular as long as the defendant could convince a magistrate that what was being done was not abuse to the animal. Though it became the law of the land, Martin may have been the only person in the country enforcing it, a task the Irishman was unusually suited for. In his youth, he had been a renowned duelist, said to have fought more than a hundred duels. In Ireland, he had ruled over a vast, desolate estate in the Connemara region, where he enjoyed a law unto himself in charge of a local militia consisting almost entirely of his tenants, engaged in smuggling booze and harboring fugitives out of the reach of the king's messengers, various agents, and debt collectors. One of his tenants once bragged to a magistrate that he and others had once tied up such a messenger, soaked his royal parchment in booze, and fed it to him piecemeal until he was drunk, and sent him running for his life. Martin lobbied for additional laws and amendments until the end of his time in Parliament. He was insulted and laughed at regularly for his animal proposals, but it didn't do much to slow him down. He may have even relished the friction he got from his political peers. He was 68 years old when the Cadillac passed. He was not tall, but stout, and quick to get his ire up. As evidenced by his dueling, he coveted his honor, which sometimes gave way to pride and temper. He was not a particularly eloquent speaker, but an effective debater, and stubborn in his positions. On the floor of Parliament, or in court, he had a knack for baiting his opponent into insulting him, after which he would reel in righteous indignation against his foe. His bill was made law on July 22, and Martin prosecuted two men from Smithfield Market on August 9th, and thereafter patrolled London, looking for violations and prosecuting them himself. So he must have been relieved when Arthur Broom came along with a plan to form the SPCA two years later. Broom also delivered some immediate help at his own expense in the form of a private investigator to share the enforcement duties with the aging Martin. The year after the society was founded, Martin proposed three separate animal cruelty bills during the 1825 session, the first of which was the most expansive of the three and sought to outlaw animal baiting, dog fighting, cock fighting, and even monkey fighting. As such, it was the first of these attempts to end cock fighting by name in the country. Home Secretary Robert Peel who would go on to create the nation's first police force and serve two terms as prime minister, said the bill's founding principles were most dangerous ones. He thought they'd result in a privileged class of animals, in addition to opposing the bill's inherent bias at policing traditionally lower-class activities with exclusion to the wealthy 
and would not permit Martin's attempt to shoehorn his previous legislation, Peel told the Commons, quote, If the honorable member wished to repress all cruelty to animals, then let him include in his bill hunting, shooting, and fishing, and I should at once understand what he is at. In 1822, the Honorable Member introduced and passed a bill to prohibit cruelty to animals. This year, he came down with a fresh bill, and if he succeeded in that, he would come next year and say, I find that there are still some animals unprotected. And as you have already given your sanction to two bills, and thereby acknowledged the justice of the principle upon which I go, you are bound to give me your support. At the end of the debate, the bill was lost in a 50-32 to 32 vote. Martin would fail again at two subsequent measures that year and introduced more the following year, though his 1822 legislation to protect cattle would be his only successful statute, thus called Martin's Act. Broom's inspector ensured Martin's quarrelsome antics were readily on display for journalists at court, and they got lots of publicity from the start. The criminal trials were well reported, and the Times and other major publications covered their meetings and were liberal with column space for opinion pieces and letters, often written pseudonymously. Despite the press coverage, members of Parliament and other influential Londoners on its rolls, the society was in debt by 1826. Broom was signed as guarantor for the society and having funded many of its expenses out of pocket, including the ongoing inspector's bill, was now broke and on the hook for the debt. Broom was sentenced to debtor's prison, and though Martin and fellow SPCA member Louis Gompertz raised the funds to get him out after a month, he'd never be reimbursed from the society for his out-of-pocket expenses. Following the insolvency, Gompertz took the reins of the SPCA and made raising funds its top priority, first in an honorary role, which was made official with the ouster of Broom as secretary in 1828. A fellow founder, Gompertz managed to lead a financial turnaround in the years after the bankruptcy, but was eventually canned himself in 1832. The only Jew of the 22 SPCA founders, Gompertz was removed when the board made a bylaw that said the society was exclusively Christian. Gompertz's philosophy was supposedly too radical for the group. Though he had written several books specifically about it before he was named secretary, he was vegan, opposed to hunting, fishing, riding, etc. For the ousted broom, though, the financial burden, dedication to the society, and ultimately his ouster from its leadership may have played a role in his personal life. Around this period, Broom's wife, Anna, moved out, taking their daughter with her. In her will, made in 1833, Anna's sister specifically excludes Arthur Broom as a recipient to a life interest left to Anna. Other factors may be to blame for the split, though none yet uncovered. It was a tough time for Broom. In January 1834, about 10 years after he had founded the society, Broom was arrested after being found drunk rolling in the mud on York Street in Westminster. Later, he told a magistrate he was, quote, distressed in his mind and had drank too much, end quote. By 1837, he was living in Birmingham, England, serving as a minister at a small informal chapel or meeting hall where he died alone from tuberculosis and was buried in an unmarked pauper's grave. So estranged was he from the society that he had founded that his death goes unmentioned in the society's meeting minutes from that time. Martin's influence in Parliament and his position among the society's board wouldn't last much longer than Broom's. Following the 1826 election, a petition circulated accusing Martin of rigging his House of Commons elections in Ireland after a mob of his supporters attempt to block a rival candidate's voters from the polling location, resulting in a riot and deaths. He was not re-elected the following term, meaning he also lost immunity from arrest for the vast debt he'd accrued for much of his life. Martin immediately fled the country to France, where he lived until his death at the age of 79 in 1834. As the House of Commons was winding up business for the day, on May 8, 1833. It was the third reading and expected approval of the Metro Police Bill to create London's first police force. First-year member of Parliament Robert Peace, also an SPCA board member, rose and proposed a clause to give these officers the power to punish anyone who keeps a place for bear baiting, dog fighting. The papers don't even report him mentioning cockfighting by name, but cockfighting will also make the list when it's written up. Taken to a vote, 42 Parliament members are for it, 40 against. The bill is read a third time and passed. This 1833 Act was the first direct hit to cockfighting in England. The 1835 Animal Cruelty Act followed, expanding the ban on cockpits or any venue for an animal fight or animal baiting to the rest of the country. It also outlawed assisting or aiding in the operation of a cockfight. It would later be repealed and reissued with similar language in the 1849 Act for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. 
1835 statute is often cited to mark the British ban of cockfighting. This significant legislation had another windfall for the animal rights movement and may have kept the SPCA from going broke a second time, ensuring the group's long-term financial success. Remember that prosecuting violations to animal rights laws was one of the society's main undertakings, but surely it was also one of the most expensive and chief among the causes that had led to the SPCA bankruptcy and Broome's financial ruin. The problem was they needed it. Martin and others' prosecutions made for major attention to the group through packed courtrooms and media coverage. The publicity notwithstanding, it was a zero-sum pursuit financially. When they won, they'd have their costs refunded, but nothing else. In unsuccessful cases, they'd get nothing. With a 100% conviction rate, they'd just break even. A provision in the 1835 Act changed all that, stipulating the prosecuting party receive half the fine levied, plus costs, in successful cases. This provision turned one of the group's largest expenses into a revenue stream, and they never looked back. By 1840, they employed five full-time inspectors in London. Two years later, they had added two inspectors to branches in West England, one in the Midlands, and one in the Northeast. They successfully prosecuted 1,357 cases in the 1830s, and another 2,177 in the 1840s, climbing in each subsequent decade until it peaked at 71,657 prosecutions in the 1890s. The 1835 law also loosened the reins on enforcement for constables, the actual police, authorizing them to make warrantless seizures of offenders and convey them to government authorities. The SPCA wielded this statute by appealing to the local constable, who was by the law compelled to intervene, usually in the company of the SPCA employees. At the start of this boom period for the SPCA, in 1832, the group set its sights on a village out in the country called Stamford. It was a tradition in Stamford, England, to host a bull running each November the 13th. They'd close up shops, pull up their wares, and take to the streets to chase a young bull all over town, hollering and going wild. They'd swing at it, yell at it, yip, whoop, whatever they had to do to get it going where it needed to go without running them through. No doubt, this all appeared to many outsiders as a mob on the brink of losing its cohesion or in the early throes of riot. And just about the time it looked to spin out of control, the throng would reel it back in, corralling the beast over a bridge bordering the town and into a meadow. Then they'd follow it over there and slaughter it. Or, if the water was up in the creek, they'd lay hold of the animal and throw it over the bridge to mark the end of the chase. They'd get a big fire going because it's November, and being a butcher's celebration, the butchers would take that meat, or other bull meat, and carve it up, and everyone would eat. A strange tradition, though one they'd been carrying on for 600 years after a 13th century earl in the time of King John saw two bulls fighting in that same meadow, and as a butcher ran out to break them up, one of the bulls bolted. The butcher and his dogs gave chase, joined by other butchers, the dogs barking and the butchers cursing. As the bull ran into town wreaking havoc, the earl rode in on horseback and helped them corner it, apparently making good sport of it, causing the earl to promise the use of that meadow to the butcher's bulls each year following the first grazing. In return, he asked the butchers to donate a bull to be chased through town by everyone exactly six weeks prior to Christmas. It was memorable enough that two accounts exist from men nearing a hundred years old in the 1920s who tell the story of the bull running to reporters. They'll still remember the excitement of the day, some 90 years earlier, when they went to Stamford in November with their parents as a child. They'll remember watching the crowd give chase and the warm meat on a cold day. People had tried to put an end to this before, when the SPCA pledged in London newspapers that it planned to prevent the 1833 bull running. They got a similar response. For a few years, the SPCA tried everything they could, finding the citizens hostile towards their efforts, and when local constables refused to help, they appealed to the local magistrates, who wouldn't budge either, and the bull running went on despite them each year. The 1835 legislation explicitly outlawed it, though, so when local officials refused to act again, the SPCA officials took evidence against eight people in town up the chain to have them prosecuted for inciting riot, organizing a bull run, and assaulting a police officer. Only three were convicted on the charges of riot, one also taking the rap for the assault, but all were sentenced leniently. Meanwhile, England's attorney general had ordered the local officials to cut it out or else, and the magistrates and constables agreed early in 1837, leading several papers to report the bull running had finally come to an end. That year in late November, one of those papers' editors got a letter from a man politely admonishing him, quote, You state that bull running this year has been suppressed. 
This I consider an insult to our borough to say that an ancient right and custom has been abolished. Allow me to inform you that the bull running this year took place as usual on the 13th of November with unabridged vigor. He was a fine animal and was followed by all the respectable persons in Stamford and the neighborhood. Pray, have the goodness to not insert any more such falsehoods respecting our bull running, for rest assured that so long as any opposition is raised against it, there will be a bull. For the people of Stamford will never allow their ancient rights and customs to be trampled upon. The editor was so surprised that he suggested it was probably a parody, but in fact, it was probably just an accurate representation of the sentiment around those parts. From the outset, London authorities, newspaper editors, and SPCA enforcers failed to grasp what pride the people in and around Stamford had in their local customs. It's a place where they hang on to what they've got. Many of its buildings were built in the 16 and 1700s, and later in the 19th century, they'll forgo early railroad developments despite being an obvious stop along the north-south thoroughfare. The more they were challenged, the larger and more crazed the crowd became, scaring off the local officials and the 200 extra constables they had assembled to prevent the bull running. The SPCA had 12 indicted, but again found magistrates lenient and sympathetic. The society continued to stoke the government to intervene and both vowed to stop it in 1838. Extra magistrates were sworn in. 20 military police were sent up from London, joined by 12 soldiers on horseback from the 14th Light Dragoons. They were going to put an end to this once and for all. Leading up to the event, government officials locked up all the bulls in the area and located two bulls locked away for the running and seized them. Then they found the backup bulls and seized those. Regardless, the streets were crowded all morning, and the appointed time came and went with no sign of a bull. Then, at about 1 p.m., the crowds parted as a servant entered the north side of town with a cow towing a cart with a seven to eight month old bull in the back. He was just passing through, sent to purchase the beeves for his master and returned to Essex with them. The magistrates watched dumbfounded as the crowd followed the no doubt bewildered servant and his cart through town. They walked out and over a bridge before the group took the cart, freed the bull and drove it back into town to the wild cries of the crowd. The dragoons were summoned and met the crowd as they chased the bull up and down the street. They quickly seized the bull and clashed with the crowd, who began throwing stones at them. One man was slashed across the neck and face with a sword when he grabbed a dragoon's horse bridle, and several were arrested, but no one was killed. Whether by chance or design, it seemed they'd gotten in one last running, managing to stick it to the meddling society, embarrassing every level of government along the way, and not really the worse for wear. The SPCA printed a letter in several papers, including the Morning Times, declaring their operation a success, thanking all the various officials and government bodies who stood with them in ending this bull running. Guess what happened next? Massive crowds had assembled the following November. The government had redoubled its forces, sending 42 dragoons, and more London police came up several days in advance. All the bulls in the surrounding countryside were snatched up by the magistrates, who also found the two hidden in town that had been set aside for the occasion. On the day of the running, hordes of people milled about the streets. A crowd estimated to usually include 400 looks to have swelled into the thousands. The hour of the running comes and goes without incident again. And as if out of thin air between 1 and 2 p.m., a bull came trotting down the road from out of town, out of sight of the dragoons patrolling the perimeter and right into the city to shouts of bull, bull. The crowd chased it through the town, up one street and down the next, eventually running it into the waiting magistrates who seized the bull in a field. The magistrates stood facing off with the crowd. They order it to disperse, but the throngs keep pouring out of the city streets, swelling the mob, some of which start throwing stones at the magistrates, who now send for the soldiers as they surround the bull in a standoff with 4,000 angry people. Finally, the troops arrive to form two columns sandwiching the magistrates and the bull between them, and they begin to advance back towards town with the bull. It was an appeal to their pockets and maybe a little to their pride that finally ended the events. The town had been on the hook for the cost of the government occupation and police response for several years in a row, and under that financial burden, agreed to cease the annual bull running if the government would stop sending troops, closing the door on the 600-year-old tradition. The year after the final Stanford bull running, on Easter Monday, 1839, one of the most high-profile cockfighting court cases resulted from a cockfight in the West London borough of Hillingdon, organized by Parliament member Grantley Berkeley, nephew of the Marlborough commander discussed earlier in this episode. The SPCA secretary, Henry Thomas, filed charges against Berkeley 
and 16 others after the fact based on testimony he received from people who were present. Less than half of the 17 defendants were successfully prosecuted. The accused cockfighters included several well-to-do farmers. In addition to Grantley Berkeley, his brothers, the Earl of Berkeley, Thomas Fitzharding Berkeley, and Parliament member George Charles Berkeley, as well as Craven Berkeley, a magistrate, were also indicted. The Berkeley's brother-in-law, George Dashwood, also a parliamentarian, was indicted as well as the famous prize fighter of the time, Thomas Winter, known throughout England in those days by his ring name, Tom Spring. The cockfight had taken place during the day at the barn nearby the home of affluent farmer Frederick Powell, who had made an agreement with Grantley Berkeley to lease the barn and hand over the keys to the property's gate to him for the day so that he could host a cockfight. Powell later informed his landlord, the Count de Solis, of the cockfight and everything seemed to be set. When all guests had arrived at the cockfight, the gates were shut and locked, and the fights got started. To his surprise, though, Powell ran into the police superintendent and a couple of workers for the SPCA inside the gates of the property after the fight had started. The cop told Powell they were in violation of the law and faced penalties up to five pounds. If it was 50 pounds, the fight should go on, for I know that double that sum would not stop it, Powell told him, explaining he'd lent it to Grantley Berkeley for the day, and the situation was out of his hands. The cop and SPCA officers never went to the barn, but lingered around the property. Once Grantley got word the cop and SPCA men were snooping around, he left the cockfight, located Police Sergeant Cooper on the property. Well, Cooper, what's to be done about this business? I can't say. I have been sent by the magistrates and have just warned Mr. Powell of the consequences, Cooper said. Come along with me to see the Count de Solis. Cooper and Berkeley went and found the Count as the cockfight carried on in the barn. In the Count's office, the men consulted the specific law in question before sending for Powell to join them. When Powell arrived, Sergeant Cooper waited outside as the men discussed their predicament. According to Berkeley, the Count said he had often fought roosters on his billiards table back in Ireland and had been planning to join the men in the barn, but after learning the specifics of the law, he felt compelled as a magistrate to avoid the cockfight and told Powell he'd pay the five-pound fine for him if it came to that. Cooper was waiting outside when the men emerged from the Count's study. Cooper, we are going to have some conversation in the barn about this business, Grantley told him. It is sufficient for you to know it shall not take place. You understand? In court testimony, Cooper would specifically remember that you understand. Grantley strolled off after saying this toward the cockfight with no intention of stopping it, and Cooper stuck around the Count's place the rest of the day anyway. When the fight ended that afternoon, as the guests were leaving the cockfight, they were stopped by Cooper and the SPCA men, who took down their names and would make the indictment list. On the date of the hearing, members of the community had crammed into the public house that hosted the trial. The spectators soon filled all the seats and standing room inside the building, and a small group waited outside the entrance. The prosecution successfully made its way through several of the lesser-known defendants early in the day, all of whom were fined five pounds plus costs. About halfway through, just as they were getting to the high-profile names, the prosecutor explained that a key witness had failed to answer his summons. He asked it to be reissued, and the case postponed, and the magistrates agreed to reissue the summonses and pick up at a later date. The only two summonses not answered, though, were the Count de Solis's and his butlers. The butler had been present inside the cockpit at the cockfight, and most in the galley, including Grantley Berkeley, probably assumed the Count was withholding the witness in an effort to protect the defendants. At the next court date, the Count was again a no-show, though he'd sent his butler along with a letter that would make it clear that he wasn't protecting the defendants, but was the missing piece to Thomas's case Though he had not mentioned it during his meeting on the day of the cockfight with Powell and Grantley Berkeley, the Count had changed his opinion of the cockfight taking place on his property after giving his initial blessing to Powell, because he'd understood it was a private gathering. He later learned there was an admission charged. To make matters worse, when he showed up to the gates of his property to inspect the situation, one of the defendants, presumably Tom Winter, had tried to run him off and wouldn't let him in the locked gates. So later, when the SPCA men arrived with Sergeant Cooper, the Count gave them a ladder to scale the fence and get into the property. He neglected to mention any of this to Grantley, though. And despite the Count's absence, the magistrates found Grantley guilty on Cooper's testimony. Charges were dropped against the remainder of the defendants, which included Grantley's brothers and brother-in-law, as well as Tom Winter. After the trial, word got around that Grantley and the Count had a heated exchange, resulting in the two agreeing to a duel. Evidence of such was presented to the magistrates, who first arrested Solace, and then Grantley Berkeley. Neither of the men seemed to have insisted on the duel afterwards. Both denied any involvement, and they were let go. As an interesting aside, 
Grantley had previously fought at least one duel. It was against William McGinn. If that name sounds familiar to you, he was the author of the opening scene last episode. McGinn had written a scathing review of Berkeley's book in Fraser's magazine. Three shots from each man were fired, but none found its target, and the duel was put to rest. In the many dozens of cockfights rated after the 1833, 1835, and 1849 laws improved on one another in England, the standard operating procedure for what to do when cops or SPCA men showed up was just to make a run for it. For much of the 1800s, if you got caught, you were looking at a five-pound fine or two months' hard labor if you couldn't pay that. At least until the 1849 Act, there was also a fair chance of claiming a technicality and getting your case tossed out or your fine reduced. Five pounds in those days was about 200, 240 bucks these days. So that's probably unaffordable to some cockers. But at the higher profile fights, where each fight in a main cost the loser anywhere from five to 50 pounds, and the event winner getting hundreds or thousands of pounds, it was not much of a deterrent. In the latter half of the century, the sport may have surged in popularity among the wealthier classes. And in this period, many of the fights would go undetected, as the participants had the means and connections to obtain quiet venues themselves and thus control the size of the crowd to friends of friends. As one example, cockers from Liverpool set a main with those from Ireland and hatched a plan to prevent interference in the high-profile fight by chartering a steamer to conduct the fights at sea. The event took place on a cool Saturday in June 1884. The dozens of men met at the Common House Quay at 8.30 a.m. on the River Liffey, the north-south split of the Irish capital of Dublin. A reporter on the scene said the guests included numerous passengers well-known in racing circles, owners, trainers, jockeys, merchants, backers, among others. When the small steamer was filled and the men were satisfied there were no snitches on board, they began the trip down the river for a pleasant ride to Houth Head. A carpet was unrolled on the deck and the fun began. Once things got underway, the reporter could see that the cocks, quote, were in the hands of no novices of the pastime. The referee chosen was a well-known layer of the odds, who has already made a name in the world of cocking, end quote. For the first fight, the Northern Ireland cock conceded three ounces to its opponent from Liverpool. The battle lasted 15 minutes, the roosters trading blow for blow, lead for lead, but in the end, the Irish bird surged to fell his opponent. Most of the fights played out in a similar back-and-forth fashion, but after six hours of fighting with a few intermissions, the Irish outmatched the Lancashire cockers, winning eight fights to one with two draws. The steamer pulled up anger, and headed back to shore with no one arrested. No one charged, apparently just a good time. One of many, I'm sure, though the sport would remain illegal in England up to the present time. Newer laws have continued to raise the stakes in the 1900s, but after the better part of two centuries, cockfighting, I'm told, persists. So too does the SPCA, now better known as the Royal Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, where the group informs the country's policymakers on everything from food and farming to the pet and trade and hunting laws. There's certainly plenty more to tell about England and its history with cockfighting, and the information is there for anyone willing to look. You can find a bibliography of all episodes, including this recent series on England, at our website, bloodlinepodcast.com. For the next full episode, we'll go to Civil War era United States to hear the story of Nick Arrington, a cockfighter and plantation owner from North Carolina, who's most famous for fighting Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana in two mains. It's just one of many wild stories about cockfighting that you'll hear in that episode from the book, The Immortal Nick Arrington. Thanks to all of you who have helped get the word out so far. Thousands of you who have listened and visited the site from all over the world. If you check out additional media for each show, go to bloodlinepodcast.com. Choose any podcast player, listen directly on our website, or find us on YouTube. Bloodline is made by me, Jesse Sidlaskis. Music from this episode is from Lobo Loco. You get the blues. Until next time. Y'all keep them crowing. Mm-hmm.